Welcome to Whores Talk Horror. We're not really whores. We just like wordplay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Whores Talk Horror. I'm Sharon. And I'm Melinda. Um, Welcome to part two of Mindy and Sharon's redemption episode. Um, (laughs) As a quick refresher, uh, Sharon and I both bombed a trivia question during our one year anniversary uh, trivia episode a couple of weeks ago that asked for the name of the serial killer who inspired the movie Scream. Uh, For the record, we now know it's Danny Rawling, a.k.a. the Gainesville Ripper. Um, But we didn't know it at the time, and uh, given our previous episode about killers who inspired horror movies, or were inspired by horror movies, add to that our damaged pride, we decided to cover two cases that neither Sharon nor I had really researched or heard that much about before. Um, Last week, in our part one episode, Sharon did a kick-ass job covering the Ketty murders from 1980. um, Why, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, That supposedly inspired the film The Strangers. If you're wondering why I said supposedly, that probably means you haven't (laughs) heard it. So I highly recommend giving it a listen because it is a doozy, crazy, interesting, and straight up just plain crazy story. But it's awesome. Uh, And thank you, Sharon, for setting such a high bar because this week it's my turn and I have a lot to live up to. So I have faith in you. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Well, gather around, children, and let me tell you the horrifying mystery of the 1946 Texarkana murders, which inspired the 1976 horror classic, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. First, I'll share some of the resources that I used when falling down this rabbit hole, and there are many, let me tell you. The lineup.com. Our friend Wikipedia, TexasMonthly.com in the culture section. Uh, There is, I didn't dig into it, but there is a whole Reddit, subreddit about these murders. So if you're into that, go for it. Uh, Medium.com. And then ArkansasOnline.com, which just this past February of 2020 actually did a recent article about these murders. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that, but it's interesting. So keep that in mind. Uh, Like with Sharon's Ketty research, this case became more and more complex the more I dug in. For time and sanity's sake, I decided to focus strictly on the murders and the victims themselves um, and not really get too caught up in the weeds. Trust me when I say that there's a plethora of sources out there on the interwebs, and I highly recommend looking into them. The ones I mentioned don't even scratch the surface. Um, But full disclosure, this case does have a lot of speculation, and I'm not a trained detective, so apologies in advance for any errors in research or whatnot. Um, There's a lot to keep straight, and uh, we really won't have time to get into the whole thing with a deep dive. But as always, we fully respect the victims and families involved and wish any remaining survivors or relatives of survivors well, and we hope that you have lived a good life. Uh, That said, let's dig in. The Texarkana Moonlight Murders, as they became known, uh, were a series of unsolved murders and other violent crimes committed in and around Texarkana in the spring of 1946 by an unidentified serial killer known as the, quote, Phantom Killer, or sometimes known as the Phantom Slayer. The killer is credited with attacking eight people within 10 weeks, five of whom were killed. That time frame during which the attacks took place was, at least to you know an outside observer like myself years later, relatively short. The killings all happened between February 22nd and May 3rd of 1946, so roughly like 10 weeks in total. The victims were mostly all in their teens or 20s, and the attacks typically occurred on secluded country roads, uh, so places that, uh, you know, youngins would go to park and neck in the woods. Woo woo! Um, In 1940 speak, these areas were referred to, quote, lover's lanes. Uh, So wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you'll hear that term brought up again and again. It means make out spot. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> for, you, for you younger listeners. Uh, the details of the crimes, which I'm going to get into, may sound familiar to a lot of you, and that's because the Texarkana murders stories have been cited as inspiration for countless urban legends and, of course, slasher films, most famously the town that dreaded sundown that I mentioned, um, and that there was a sequel that followed, but whatever. The name of the film, though, references the early curfews that were enforced during that 10-week period in 1946 when the killer was walking amongst the normal peaceful community of Texarkana, and needless to say, everyone was scared shitless. And rightly so. Um, What's more unsettling about this, for me at least, is that the case still technically remains unsolved 70 years later. Um, So in total, five people were actually murdered by this unknown killer, while three others survived their attacks. Two of the three that survived were the first to be attacked by the phantom killer, and I'm going to refer to him as that going forward just for clarity's sake um that's a name that he this well or she i guess the killer earned by a witness testimony stating that he wore a white mask or sack with holes cut out for eyes so the first attack was on february 22nd of 1946 uh, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry parked their car on a secluded road outside of town. They were avid astrologists. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> they were making out. They were totally making out. The phantom killer approached the car, initially blinding them with his flashlight and then ordering them out of the vehicle by gunpoint. Jimmy was told to drop his pants and was subsequently beaten severely by the phantom so much so that his skull was actually fractured. The phantom then told Mary Jean to run, but as she headed towards a ditch, he told her to run for the main road. And I probably should have said this at the beginning, but trigger warning for violence all throughout this piece, but right now especially. The phantom actually chased Mary Jean down the road, caught up to her, sexually assaulted her with the pistol that he'd had on him before letting her run away a second time. So clearly from the start, this guy seemed to enjoy torturing his victims. Um, astonishingly, despite such savage attacks, both Jimmy and Mary Jean survived. Wow. Yeah, I know. In the wee hours of Sunday, March 24th, so a little over a month later, uh, Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore were found dead in their parked Oldsmobile sedan at, you guessed it, the end of a secluded road. Uh, the following is from an article titled Phantom Killer, the Unsolved Mystery of the Texarkana Murders, written by Oren Gray for lineup.com. Quote, the couple who had only been dating six weeks had had dinner with Griffin's sister and her boyfriend earlier that night. Griffin, 29, was a veteran who made his living in carpentry and painting. He was shot fatally in the back of the head. Moore, who was only 17, was living in a nearby boarding house with her cousin. She was also fatally shot in the back of the head, unquote. The couple's car was found by a passing motorist between 8.30 and 9 a.m., so likely just a few hours after the murder took place. And the motorist initially thought that the couple were asleep. Griffin was found between the front seats on his knees with his head resting on his crossed hands and his pockets turned inside out. Moore was found sprawled face down in the back seat. There is evidence, however, to suggest that she was killed on a blanket outside the car and then placed inside. Both victims were fully clothed, though a blood-soaked patch of earth near the car suggested to police that they had been, they had actually both been killed outside the car and placed back in afterwards. Congealed blood was found covering the running board and it had flowed through the bottom of the car door itself. A 32 cartridge shell was also found, possibly shot from a Colt pistol wrapped in a blanket. Wait, just to um, go back and clarify. So yeah. was the boy found in like a praying position? I mean, 
Is that how it was described? Yeah, that's how it's described. Like, I that was what I pictured actually. Yeah, he yeah he was uh, on his knees, like with his head resting on his crossed hands. So mm-hmm. he might have been posed that way because um, it sounds like they police don't really think that they were actually killed in the car, which is kind of even creepier if that's how okay, he so was posed. Neither of them were thought to be killed in the car. I thought it was right. just the girl at first, but. Uh, well, yeah, given the amount of blood evidence, they they kind of because there's really no way to know for sure. That's like the problem with the story. But like they that's what they surmised based on the evidence they found. Um, OK, I just wanted to uh, clarify because, no, yeah. yeah, I was I was like, was he, you know, praying for his life or was it possible that he was posed in that position? So, OK, yeah, Thank you. I, ugh, scary either way. By March 27th, so just a few days later, Texas and Arkansas City Police had interviewed around 50 to 60 witnesses, including patrons and employees of Club Dallas, a local bar near the crime scene. By March 30th, a $500 reward, or remember this is 1946, so that's a lot of money, was posted in an effort to gain any new information on the Griffin and Moore case that would lead to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible. However, the re- rewards yielded no fruitful clues or suspects, instead producing over 100 false leads. So no rest for the wicked, I guess, because early morning on Sunday, April 14th, 1946, Betty Jo Booker, age 15, and her friend Paul Martin, age 17, became the Phantom's second double murder victims. Side note, while the 1976 film changed and probably exaggerated some of the details, This murder scene in particular is the one that immediately comes to mind when I think of this film. Just a quick side note there. Uh, Saturday, April 13th, so the day before the murder, Betty Jo, who played alto saxophone, what up, band kids, um, (laughs) had a regular weekly performing gig at the local VFW club with her band, The Rhythm Airs. So cute. Mm. Um, so around 1.30 a.m., which would have then been Sunday the 14th, um, her friend Paul Martin picked her up after the performance was over. This was the last time the pair were seen alive. Martin's body was found at around 6.30 a.m., uh, again, that same day, by Mr. and Mrs. G.H. Weaver and their son, The body was lying on its left side by the northern edge of North Park Road. Blood was found further down on the other side of the road by a fence. Martin had been shot four times, once through the nose, once through the left fourth rib from behind, a third time in the right hand, and finally through the back of the neck. Jesus. So, uh, quick question. Sure. they were not found in a car. No. Um, one, well, he was not, no. Okay, was there a car nearby? Were they also parked and maybe chased down? Because it seems like his gun entrance wounds are... Most of them seem like they probably came from behind, like he was running away from the you're suspect. Very, you're very observant, but uh, hang in there. We're going to get to that in a second. Oh, okay. So, Betty Joe Booker's body was not found until approximately 11.30 a.m. behind a tree, almost two miles from Martin's body. She was found by members of the Boyd family and their friends who had joined the local search party. Her body was lying on its back, fully clothed, with the right hand in the pocket of the buttoned overcoat. Booker had been shot twice, once through the chest and once in the face. The weapon used was the same as in the double, the first double murder, a 32 automatic Colt pistol. Um, Paul Martin's car was found about three miles away from Booker's body, so roughly 1.55 miles from where his own body was found. Mm. It was parked outside Spring Lake Park with the keys still in it. 
the authorities were not sure who was shot first. Police said that examinations of the bodies indicated that both victims had put up a terrific struggle. Way to go, you two. Um, Martin's friend, Tom Al, Al Britton, I believe is it's pronounced, said Martin had no enemies, nor did he believe that Booker and Martin could have had any kind of argument that would result in such violence. So in other words, it doesn't sound like they were fighting and killed each other. Uh, Booker's, <laughs> Which would have been impossible since their bodies were miles apart. Again, it was 1946. You never know what they thought. (laughs) Um, Booker's saxophone was nowhere to be found at the crime scene and was eventually discovered around six months later on October 24th, still in its black imitation leather case in an underbrush near where her body had been found. As we said already, there were search parties, so if they found her body, it kind of stands to reason they should have found the saxophone had it been there all along. Again, since this is unsolved, we technically don't have an answer, but there's tons of theories, of course. Um, So after both were found, um, a reward fund exceeding $1,700 was accrued for information leading to the person or persons responsible for the Griffin Moore and Martin Booker murders. Thank you, Spencer, for the calculations. By the way, $1,700 is about 24000 adjusted for inflation for 2020, just FYI. Uh, rumors circulated throughout the area, but on April 18th, Police issued a statement to the public verifying that the murderer had not been caught and that the rumors circulating among the public and in the newspapers were, quote, a hindrance to the investigation and harmful to innocent persons, unquote. Um, And quick side note about the saxophone that went missing. Um, There is no answer as to why it was not found necessarily when uh, Booker's body was found, but... I personally think it might have been staged there later. Um, We were kind of talking off air about that as well. Uh, If you ever do watch the 1976 film, uh, Betty Jo's death is not visually as gruesome as modern audiences probably would expect, but it's pretty awful. And all I'm going to say is that in the movie, she plays a trombone, not a saxophone, and uh, you'll get a pretty good idea of what probably happened to that instrument. I'm going to leave it at that. Hmm. Which brings us now to May 3rd of 1946 and what were believed to be the Phantom's final, quote, official, unquote, crimes. Unlike the other attacks, the May victims were not necking on Lover's Lane after curfew, nor were they teenagers. They were farmers living in a ranch-style home on 500 acres of farmland, roughly 10 miles northeast of Texarkana. Sometime before 9 p.m. on May 3rd, Virgil Starks, age 37, turned on his favorite weekly radio show and his wife... Podcast. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, podcasts were invented in 1945. I apologize. Continue. That was a, that, no, but I, that's funny. I like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, think of it as a podcast, but you don't get to choose what you listen to, it's, and it's up to whatever you're... <laughs> iPod can catch on the waves. Yeah, pretty much. Your old timey podcast or your old timey, uh, what'd you call it? iPod? iPad. iPod. Yeah, there you go. iPod, they, whatever. They should make iPods that have dials for a radio or an iPod that is a radio. Anyway, proceed. Uh, Virgil's wife, Katie, age 36, gave him a heating pad for his sore back. He sat in the armchair in the sitting room, which was just off the kitchen and the bedroom. Katie was lying on the bed in her nightgown in the bedroom when she heard something from the backyard and asked Virgil to turn down the radio. Seconds later, while Virgil was reading the May 3rd edition of the Tex Arcana Gazette, two shots were fired into the back of his head from a closed double window three feet away. Jesus. So, yeah, yeah. So shot through the window, essentially. Ugh. Katie heard what, quote, sounded like the breaking of glass, unquote, and thought Virgil had dropped something. So she went to check on him. As she entered the living room, she saw Virgil stand up 
and then suddenly slumped back into his chair. She saw blood, then ran to him and lifted up his head. When she realized he was dead, she ran to the phone to call the police. Now, again, for you youngins listening, traditional <laughs> landline phones, as we know them now, didn't really even exist in 1946. Katie and Virgil had a wall crank phone, so you'd have to just, like, crank the thing and dial an operator. So uh, that's what she did. Katie rang twice before she was shot twice in the face. Ah. Oh. One bullet entered her right cheek and exited behind her left ear. The other went in just below her lip, breaking her jaw and splintering out several teeth before lodging under her tongue. She dropped to her knees, but girlfriend got right back up, running to get a pistol from the living room, because hell yeah. By now she was basically blinded by her own blood when she heard her, the rusted screen wire on the back porch tearing loose. Oh my God. So the exact events that followed in the home with Katie are slightly unclear to me due to like time, but also Katie's disorientation and panic in the moment. Um, the important point is that the Phantom actually made it into into the side screen porch through the back screen door, but thankfully Katie heard him. And later days, the fuck balls out the front door reportedly leaving behind a, quote, virtual river of blood, unquote, and teeth throughout the house. Barefoot and still in her blood-soaked nightgown, Katie made it across the street and by street, I mean highway, because, again, we're talking farm country, finally arriving at her sister and brother-in-law's house. But son of a bitch, they weren't home. Eventually, Katie made it in her condition to the A.V. Prater farmhouse, which was yet another 50 yards away from her sister's home. Thankfully, the Praters were home and called for help. A great article on this case, which I think I forgot to mention at the top, but we'll have the link by the Texarkana Gazette, states that, quote, officers arrived in time to find the Starks' living room filled with smoke from a shorted out heating pad burning in Stark's chair as he remained slumped over from two gunshot wounds to the back of his head. The killer tracked bloody footprints through the living room he then exited the front door and across the highway. Police canine units followed a, the suspect's trail on the highway for about 200 yards before they crossed back to the other side of the highway and lost the scent about a half mile later, unquote. So remember the bullets were, that were found from the gunshot wounds? We'll get back to those in a second. Um, but there were some clues that were found at the Starks' home, one was a flashlight that was found in a hedge outside the window where Virgil Starks had been shot, which was sent off to Washington for further analysis. Unfortunately, on May 9th, police were notified that the flashlight from the murder scene contained no fingerprints at all. With good intentions, I'm sure, police released a photo of the flashlight to the public, asking if anyone had any knowledge of who it might belong to. The May 11th edition of the Texarkana Gazette featured a joint statement from both the sheriff and chief of police urging citizens to think about the dates of each of the phantom attacks and to report anything odd about those dates that they could remember in hopes of unearthing some overlooked clue. The following is a quote from said statement, and I'm sure you might have a good idea as to where this is headed. Quote, all information received will be treated confidentially. We urge you to come in and tell what you know. Don't be hesitant or fear that you are causing an innocent man embarrassment and trouble in as much all investigation will be confidential. This is no time to take any chance on information which might lead us to the slayer. This maniac must be captured. We believe that we are justified in going to any ends to halt this chain of murder bear in mind this killer may strike at anyone he may strike at persons close to him for that reason we believe any person with information 
that may lead us to the murderer should act in the interest of self-preservation. Okay, wait. Before you go on, I've been dying to know, did Katie survive being shot in the face? That's a good question, because why would the police be putting out this this statement? Um, She did survive. Uh, She, unfortunately, when she came to, had no memory of what the killer looked like. Um, Uh, I'm just really impressed and glad that she survived, though, because holy shit, talk about a fucking nightmare coming to life. And also, as we mentioned last week, The Strangers is basically like a what to not do if someone, you know, what to not do in case of a home invasion. She did the exact opposite. So don't do what uh, Liv Tyler does. Do what Katie does. (laughs) Well, and like... I was also thinking that how else are we going to know that all of this happened if she hadn't survived at least for a little while? Oh, shit. Good point. I didn't even think about that. I was just so engrossed in the story. (laughs) Well, I mean, no, but seriously, because like I was surprised. I thought they were going to say that she ended up not making it, you know, and she did. She did. I read that she did later have uh, some complications with the bullet that went in the area of her tongue like she had to obviously have surgeries and such done but she she did live yeah it's and also she could have survived for you know a couple days or something and then passed away after she told her story to the cops so but she survived long term okay great and sadly though she didn't really have anything to offer the cops and really at this point because you know the only other two survivors were the first two victims they, the killer was described as he, they said he, he blinded them with their flash with his flashlight uh, and then he had a hood on his face so they they couldn't tell they they didn't know what he looked like you know they really kind of had nothing given all of that and the fact that the the police issued this joint statement about <laughs> if you see something say something it's a small town it's 1946 I understand that there's an urgency here. And, like, oftentimes really horrible people are able to blend in really well in a society. Like, let's be honest. I mean, you know, oh, he was so nice and quiet. I never would have guessed. We hear that how many times in true crime shows or movies? But this is where, I, for me, it gets problematic because, on the other hand, openly telling the public that there are no leads and giving citizens agency to report their neighbor for so much as giving them an odd look during a mass panic isn't exactly a more effective tactic. Um, The Gazette could have saved time and printing ink by simply running the headline, witch hunt for masked man is a go, people. Like, (laughs) it kind of unleashed a witch hunt. Uh, People lost their shit. In Texarkana in 1946, everybody knew each other. Folks rarely locked their doors, even at night, actually. And in May of 1946, all of that changed. Residents not only locked their doors, but straight up barricaded both the doors and even nailed sheets and other blockades to their windows. Uh, Curfews went into effect hardcore, which resulted in a loss of revenue for a few local businesses. Uh, Locksmiths, however, and gun retailers, they were making a killing uh, (laughs) because everybody was, you know, bringing up, they were souping up their uh, security and they were packing. By May 9th, guard dogs became super popular Citizens barricaded themselves in their homes or opted for stays at hotels or with relatives because safety in numbers. Some residents went so far as to build, and this kind of makes me laugh, homemade booby traps around their homes. So basically, Texarkana residents were jittery, paranoid, and packing heat. It's safe to say tensions were running high in town, (laughs) and local police departments were inundated with calls from terrified residents convinced that they were in danger. On Friday, May 10th, police rushed to investigate a claim of strange sounds coming from an upstairs room, only to find the family cat thrashing around in a trash bin. (laughs) Uh, A report of a prowler bumping up against a house turned out to actually be a hedge hitting the window when the wind would blow. One family actually called the cops because they heard a tapping on their front door. And that one actually did turn out to be legit. It was a messenger who had been trying to deliver a special letter. I 
am your singing telegram. Right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> clue reference. That was a clue reference, people. You get 100 points if you got that. So uh, anyway, the overall lack of consistent facts didn't help matters, clearly. So getting back to those, the bullets that were found at the Starks crime scene uh, that killed Virgil Starks, those were actually 22 caliber bullets, most likely to have been shot by an automatic rifle. Betty Jo Booker, Paul Martin, Richard Griffith, and Polly Ann Moore were all killed with bullets from a 32 automatic Colt pistol. Similarly, the first victims were all in their teens or 20s, as mentioned, and were considered lover's lane victims, as they were all found, you know, parking along secluded roads. In contrast, the Starks were attacked in their home, which again was about 10 miles northeast of Texarkana, but age-wise they were older than the Phantom's previous victims and attacked with a murder weapon that was inconsistent with all the previous attacks. Hmm. So over the years, um, a number of people have been added to and then scratched off the possible Phantom suspect list. Uh, There was just not any one definitive piece of evidence that justified a case, let alone a conviction. The police also had their share of enthusiastic tipsters whose leads either fizzled out or led to dead ends. And the influx of calls from imposters giving false confessions only exacerbated officers who were required to look into every lead so like just imagine just chasing false leads all over when there's some maniac running around how frustrating theories spread wildly about the phantom killer's identity many in the area believe that the killer was some sort of sex maniac nearly 400 people in total were arrested in connection with the killings though no right though no conviction was ever made uh, that sounds like the population of Texarkana. Right? I don't know. I know. Everyone's a suspect. Is, but... So possible suspects included the likes of a University of Arkansas freshman who committed suicide in 1948, or an escaped German prisoner of war, and an L.A. resident who believed that he may have committed the crimes while he was in a coma. Viable suspects, all. Many locals, however, believed the Phantom to be, and I've heard this pronounced a few ways, so I'm going to go with Yul Swinney, who was a local con man who was arrested in 1947 for auto theft. His wife actually confessed to as much at the time, but later repudiated her confession. Swinney remained in prison as a habitual offender until 1973, when he and then he died in 1994 without ever implicating himself in the murders so i kind of feel like that one's kind of a loss because yeah regardless of the killer's true identity the town he traumatized has never been the same since the spring of 1946 clearly yet while other towns may have tried to forget such a gruesome legacy texarkana embraces it when the town that dreaded sundown was filmed there in 1976 yes they filmed it there in town locals were cast as extras the movie itself is done as kind of a documentary piece like in that style but you can very much tell that a lot of the people are extras it's it's quite worth the watch um and then every year around halloween the they screen the movie around spring lake park near where one of the murders took place if you'd rather not travel to Texarkana to see the town that dreaded sundown, you can watch it from the comfort of your own home. The movie is currently streaming on the usual services, but specifically, I think I watched it on Amazon Prime. It's um, been a while since I saw the... Is it a sequel or is it just... It's not a remake. I think it's a sequel. So, yeah, then there was... And I, Spencerpedia, maybe you have this because I forgot to look this up, but there is a sequel that was made a few years ago and it's set in Texarkana um and but isn't that about like how they do the movie screening every year it's more of like a um it's made to be like this is how Texarkana is now where they kind of celebrate the film it's almost like a spoof kind of like Wes Craven's new nightmare where it's like 
Yeah. They know that this mo- the original movie from 1976 exists and this town like embraces it. But then a real killer shows up imitating those original murders. Right, right, right. IMDb says for that one that came out in 2014, 65 years after a masked serial killer terrorized the small town of Texarkana, the so-called Moonlight Murders begin again. Is it a copycat or something even more sinister? A lonely high school girl with dark secrets of her own may be the key to catching him. Yes, it kind of takes fact and fiction and blends it. There's a lot of people in that movie, actually, like character actors, you know, um, but... I, I will be honest and say the only reason I watched that movie, it was a while ago before I even thought about researching this, was because one of the guys in it is or was on Boardwalk Empire and he is in the Netflix documentary that's amazing, American Vandal. Uh, he's the fruit ninja from the, sec- from the second series. And that was literally the only reason I watched it. It's okay, but the original... I, I think it's worth watching the original, especially because it's filmed there and it's done in a really interesting way, you know, and it's very 70s, but set to be in the 40s. I, You know, it, it's, it's a must watch horror movie, I'd say for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so these crimes did have a bigger effect that like extended past Texarkana. The killer and the image, which, again, is still kind of speculative since only two people sort of saw him, really, it's kind of a staple in horror movies. He was described as wearing, uh, and I'll I'll post, we'll post pictures on Instagram and our Patreon subscribers might get a little something, something to look at on our website. But um, the killer wears, you know, the shaggy looking, like, not even a, like a sack, I guess, but it just maybe could be a pillowcase like just the nondescript whatever with the holes cut out for eyes and it it it's just creepy and gross and and that's i think been in however many horror movies um and supposedly that that image is something that was that was inspired by the story i don't know that that's true necessarily but it definitely sounds like it um i mean including the strangers or yeah exactly exactly um and then there's also the infamous urban legend of the teen couples in a car late at night, up to no good. Usually that one goes, you know, the radio's on and they hear there's an escaped convict or an escaped men- mental patient out on the loose and they hear the knocking on the roof and then like one of them turns up dead or there's a hook on the door or something. I think that that urban legend specifically stems from like quite a few different real life sources but it's one that's also been claimed to have been inspired by you know the lover's lane killings um i personally feel that a seemingly invisible killer who just really can't be fine i mean the golden state killer even like someone like that can't be found can't be stopped is super terrifying and uh especially back in 1946 when there's no security cameras anywhere or right you know, people don't even have phones that <laughs> right. you have to, like, call an operator to... With a crank. Yeah, with a crank. Um, so. One thing I will say is that, and I, I got through some of it, but there's a lot, so not all, really. But um, just this past February of 2020, FBI actually uh, released the case files that they... The ar- well, the archives of the case files that they have on this story. Um, It is presented on uh, ArkansasOnline.com's website. We'll post the link. But it's hard to read because all of the documents are like scanned old scratches of paper from like the 40s, you know. There's, just as an example, the archive... Is, has more than like 1,100 pages and reveals memoranda and reports, news clippings, including some from the Texarkana uh, Gazette, correspondence to and from law enforcement, including J. Edgar Hoover, uh, and there's photographs of evidence, which I, I couldn't really look at. Um, there's also a list of suspects dating from 46 to 49. I, I think it, it's an interesting deep dive, but... It's a lot of content, and I kind of wanted to focus on the the victims and not have us sitting here for five hours discussing all the ins and outs. But we'll post the links, and it's definitely something interesting to look at. 
If you're into that sort of thing, but that is the alleged true story of the Texarkana murders, the phantom moonlight slayer, whatever, many names, crazy guy who killed people. Uh, It's a horrible story, and it it did inspire horror movies and films and tropes, but um, who knows? He may still be out there, or she. They would be really, really old. I know, right? That's the only thing that I... Because when I rewatched the movie, I will say that the scene with the musical instrument, it just it creeps me out. And uh, I just kept thinking, whoever this is is probably dead. They're probably dead now. Do you have any theories on what happened with the couple that was found several miles apart from each other with the saxophone? Um, I only... I mean, honestly... <laughs> Sorry, I stopped myself up right there because it's hard because these are real people. But um, and and the town that dreaded sundown is a movie, obviously. But the 1976 version kind of provides somewhat decent theories. um, But I think the guy really liked to scare and torture people. Uh, So, you know, he would have like with the first couple, he had Jimmy remove his pants and get on the ground. and then, like, had the his girlfriend running all over, and then he'd, like, pretend he wasn't there and then catch up to her and, like, assault her and then let her get away again. And so it seemed to be like he liked to toy with them. Um, so I don't remember specifically what happens with the boyfriend in that portion of the movie, but I think that he split them up and, and tortured them separately. And I do think that, especially um, our conversation about, you know, the couple that was found in the car, like the, the, there was staging going on for sure. Mm. Um, yeah, it's been a while since I've seen the original. Um, I remember the sequel or the second one better, um, but I'm going to have to watch that because Spencer has actually not seen either of those movies. So it'll be a good rewatch for both of us, especially after hearing the true life story because, uh, yeah, I didn't know any of the actual details about what happened, but good job. Thank you. And the the thing is, too, though, that like the reason I didn't get into like too much of the investigation is because there is a lot there, too, of course, Um, you know, with it being a small town and everything, the FBI did get involved. And like there was a there was something I read about uh, a local um, like psychiatric hospital that had offered files on patients that they that had been released, but that had a history with either like being a war veteran or or someone who would know how to handle weapons essentially and and their potential you know psychiatric makeup who they thought might be viable suspects and the police said oh great we'll come pick those up and they never did so there is some of that going on behind the scenes too but like again it is just so intricate that I was like we'll be here all day but the victims are the most important part and it would be interesting and hopefully somewhat healing for the families of their of them that survive if they did find at least some clue as to who this is because or was because the idea that someone could just walk into a town cause all this chaos and disappear what the fuck like (laughs) but honestly since these crimes took place outside there probably wasn't a ton of evidence collected and if there was it's probably been contaminated or thrown out over you know after 70 years there is like DNA was not even a glimpse oh. <laughs> of of what may come in the future. You know, like that wasn't so it was so far away from what would eventually come that I don't think back then they really saved evidence the way they did maybe in the 70s or 80s. So. Oh, for sure. And like like I said, when I looked at some of the FBI documents on the website, like a lot of the reason I didn't really dive in is because I couldn't really read a lot of it because a lot of it was like, you know, somebody's handwriting that had been copied, you know, like photocopied because mm-hmm. they didn't have digital, like, you know, so whatever FBI, the FBI still had that was retained was all paperwork that somehow got scanned, which also loses translation in terms of quality. So like I, I just it was kind of frustrating because I was like, well, this might be interesting, but I have no idea what this chicken scratch says. So, um, yeah. so yeah, but yeah, that is the story. And the picture of the killer as, as shown in the films is pretty traditional horror movie scary, but 
it still creeps me out. So we'll post some of those pictures like on Instagram and stuff like that. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. We hope you enjoyed the last two episodes. Maybe we'll do a third part because there are definitely a lot more horror movies out there that were inspired by real life murders. Uh, If you are able to, please subscribe to our Patreon. If you want to have early access to episodes, see exclusive posts, and receive cool shit. If you go to Whores Talk Horror on Instagram, you'll find a link to our Patreon there. Be sure to check us out on Twitter and Facebook as well. And email us at whorestalkhorror at gmail.com if you want to share any ghost stories, creepy stories, true crime stories, UFO sightings, home invasion stories, uh, or if you just want to say hello. And as always, thanks Thanks for for getting getting creepy with us. Sharon, you want a beer? Uh, Oh my God.